uh, I was accepted for uh, U.S. Air Force fighter pilot training. I was I, at that time. I, my family, I, <clears throat> living with a broken family. My older brother was my uh, uh, caretaker. And he had to sign this application. And he looked at it. He said, this, he said, are you crazy, Walter? He said, you're gonna, you could get killed this way. And he tore up the application for, so my other alternative would have been a fighter pilot. Okay, days go on. And uh, I met another person and uh, he told me about the United States Merchant Marine Academy that was then being developed in Kings Point, Long Island, New York. And it was clear that they were going to need a massive Merchant Marine to transport uh, all of the uh, supplies required to fight a war. I. It's a federal academy. There are uh, four other academies. There's the Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, Military Academy, uh, Coast Guard. This, uh, Kings Point is the fifth federal academy. So I had to take examinations. I passed the examination. I was told that I was accepted. <clears throat> when I brought that, application home, and Frederick looked at it. He signed it. What he didn't know at that time were the casualties for the Merchant Marine at that time were about 30 times higher than the Air Force. Okay. So that's, so I, I got in, I went through their basic training. Part of their basic training was to uh, actually go to sea during the war on board a ship, experienced uh, wartime conditions, and, uh, and it was during these <clears throat> first uh, six months that I saw my first action, saw ships go down, and uh, so on. So does that answer the question? Yeah, where did you, uh, after your training then, where was your first... Uh, I'm sorry, talk a little slower, please. Where was your first seaborne experience? My sea experience? Where, the first one. Where was your first trip? It was a, a, a tiny little ship <laughs> that... It, it, it was, it was uh, so small and so useless that, the, that we didn't even have a convoy. And we took a, a cargo of mines that uh, if people don't know what mines are, that's too late to tell them now. <clears throat> but uh, we uh, took a cargo of mines to, uh, uh, to Bermuda, running alone by ourselves. Okay. You had a unique experience in Bermuda, as I recall. You can't talk that fast, or I am not going to be able to understand you. Okay. okay. You had a unique experience in Bermuda as I recall. Oh, you don't want to hear all that crap, okay? I, I was a small, I was a, 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 a farm kid who went along, who went ashore with a couple of seasoned sailors and, and we got drunk and, and uh, uh, I ended up in jail because I ran over a policeman with my bicycle <clears throat> and uh, Prior to that, we had not been accepted by the crew or the captain because we were considered as 90-day wonders and uh, uh, pristine. But after they saw that I could evidently get drunk and fight and, and get locked up in jail, uh, I was accepted by the captain of the crew and they, be <laughs> they you know, we, we began to be friends and I began to learn my profession. So. Okay. And then what happened after that? After what? After you left Bermuda, you ended up on another ship, as I recall. <laughs> if I wrote a book. If, you, if we're going to do the book here, that's, uh, that's, then we do the book. I went to another ship. I went to another ship. This was a faster ship. We uh, went to, what did we do? 
took a cargo of uh, 500 pound bombs to uh, England. And uh, I guess that's what we did. We were running in convoy. I saw some ships get blown up. I was terrified. Uh, and uh, so that was it. So I finally completed my, we call it our midshipman sea year. I completed that term, and then I returned to King's Point for uh, the rest of my training, which would be technical, technical training, seamanship, uh, ship handling, ship loading, this type of thing, okay. navigation. On that first convoy, was the ship was the ship that you were on? Was it attacked? We were attacked, but we were not hit. You know, the ship ahead of us. Uh, one row ahead of us and one to the left of us, one hit and sunk, yeah. Were you allowed to stop and pick up survivors on those trips? No. It depends on the circumstances, but <clears throat> normally we did not. You did not. <clears throat> no, you, uh, so, no, they died. Uh -huh. So, uh, <laughs> you got some very Profuse notice there, Dan. I do. Okay. Well, after you you uh, you second uh, cargo, where did where did you take that? To Scotland, was it? I'm sorry. On your trip across the Atlantic, yeah. you had a cargo. Did you end up in Scotland with that cargo? Yeah, I think one of them ended up in Scotland. Yeah, and uh, we had a, a load of bombs. I had some adventures in Scotland, but. Uh, I don't want to convey the idea that this is all fun and games, that, uh, that you go someplace and and, uh, 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 and then when you get there, you stay drunk for a week or something like that. Uh, we were always happy to, uh, to have arrived because normally we, we, it was rare to end up with the same number of ships that you started out with. So this, this, is, this is not a happy, fun uh, review. Okay, this this was a terrible time for my life. Uh, the number of people killed in the Merchant Marine just to fight this bloody war. Okay, and, and what you will hear from me, it will be no praise whatsoever for World War I or II or anything since that time. Not a single one of these wars was warranted Period. Okay. What about after you delivered your cargo in Scotland? I'm sorry? After you delivered your cargo in Scotland, did you head back to the States? Yeah, of course. Then, then you deliver your cargo, you wait for a, uh, for an empty convoy to make up, and then you come back to the States, and, uh, and then you uh, have a few days ashore while you uh, reload or go to another ship. And, and then, you, then you're then you off to another port, to another ocean, another war someplace. Now, if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly from your memoirs, after you returned from your convoy over to Scotland and yep. came back, you went back to King's Point for further training? That's correct, yeah, that, that's some time in there, yeah. But then there were nine months concentrated classroom uh, training. And, and this is where we learn how to be ship's officers, how to, how to be able to um, operate a ship, how to load a ship, how to navigate a ship, how to, how to do whatever is necessary to get cargo in a ship, take it to where it's supposed to go, unload it, and uh, come back and get some more. Yeah, good question. And then after King's Point, the second time, where did you go? Okay, now, after I graduate from King's Point, I have a choice. <clears throat> I, am, I am automatically an ensign in the U.S. Naval Reserve. So if I wish, I can go in the Navy at that point and join the Navy. And <clears throat> probably out of our class of 25 persons, uh, maybe eight of them did go in the Navy. And, and several of them went on to uh, pretty distinguished careers in the Navy. The rest of us had either a third mate's license 
or a third engineer's license. This enabled us to, now we're, now we're actually in a civilian role. And uh, this allows us to go to a union shipping hall where, where the crews are supplied for the various ships and the term used is sign on. And, uh, and at that time, when I was third mate, I would be able to uh, sign on as a third mate. A merchant ship at that time had, had the captain, the master, who was in charge of the entire ship, the chief mate, who was the master's executive, who, who ran the ship and saw that it, every, the second mate, who was essentially the navigator, and the third mate, who was the safety officer. So what happened then? I mh you, you graduated, you became the uh, second mate, was it? We graduated as third mates. Third mates, okay. After a period of service in, in the role of third mate, and after a required period of sea time required by the Coast Guard, <clears throat> then you were allowed to take the Coast Guard examinations for the next rank which would, in this case, be uh, second mate. So, sure. when, when the opportunity presented itself, I was able to take the Coast Guard exam, and I became a second mate, okay? On the second mate, that, we went to Russia uh, in, on, the, uh, on second mate. When we, when we came back, and I had accumulated enough time and so on, I could take my examinations for chief mate which I did, which I passed, and now I am able to, I, I'm, I'm the executive officer of the ship. And, and in that voyage, uh, we went to Japan. That was, that was the first post-war voyage uh, to Japan. Okay, I continued to take, and I don't know if this will show close up, but th this is my license as master of any ship. And it's issued, as you see, by the Coast Guard. Sure. Okay. Right. You mentioned you had a, um, that you had a uh, convoy to Russia. That's correct. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <sighs> it uh, was in the winter, I think, of either began October, November, 45, and uh, it was a convoy of maybe 30 other ships, and uh, we were carrying a very diverse kind of cargo to Russia. Uh, we had uh, even had some steamboat uh, uh, railroad uh, locomotives on deck. But we, we, this was a, a very heavily defended convoy. We uh, went up uh, close around the coast of uh, Denmark. Uh, we saw a lot of action along the way. The weather, though, was the, the most the terrible part of it. But uh, uh, it was, it was during, it was on that convoy that, uh, uh, that I guess. Uh, when I, I could see I was the most terrified uh, considering the weather. Uh, it, it's impossible to describe uh, an Arctic uh, winter storm. And uh, uh, this storm is dispersing the convoy and driving us toward the shore of Denmark where we don't want to be. And uh, uh, the ships are rolling to the point where some of them rolled over. Whoa. Okay. So this was a pretty terrifying experience. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so I, I don't know what there is to say. You get, you go there and you, you dump your cargo and uh, uh, the Russians were very oppressive. There was, there was uh, uh, all, uh, all of the cargo was handled by women. The, the women, stevedore, women, women really ran the port under the supervision of soldiers. So, uh, and 
uh, we had to go down through the uh, White Sea, which was totally frozen over. So icebreakers, Russian icebreakers, would uh, break a path in front of us, and then we would uh, move a, a little bit along, uh, and then they would come around and break another path, and so on. So it was uh, all in all it was a, an experience. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any sense why it was all Russian women as stevedores? Were all the men in the army? I think you've answered your own question, yeah. yeah. Sure, the, the men were either uh, killed. Uh, let me interject this. The Russians beat the Germans. Nobody else. The Russians inflicted 80% of the casualties on the German military forces. And the, and the German, the, the Russians lost 30 million plus military casualties, 30 million. We lost, I don't know, maybe uh, 11, if that much, yeah. <clears throat> So the, the, this is something that people should know, is that the Russians won World War II for us. We supplied, in, in most cases, the, uh, uh, the equipment, uh, often the tanks, the aircraft, the, the garments that let them operate uh, in the uh, uh, Arctic. But the Russians uh, really won World War II, and they are not given credit for it. At the end of the war, where there should have been continued cooperation between uh, the Russians and the U.S., and, and when Russia signaled its, its willingness to continue uh, discussions toward a worldwide peaceful uh, detente that could accommodate the aspects of socialism and imperialism, uh, the U.S. shot it down. Did you make any more trips across the Atlantic during the war? Did you make any further convoys across the Atlantic? After war. I made trips to the Mediterranean. Uh, to uh, where else? Belgium. Uh, North uh, Europe. Yeah, I, I made many trips, many trips. So. Well, your memoirs state that on one of the trips coming back home, you carried about 300 German prisoners. Yeah. And as I recall, you said in your memoirs that the German prisoners were not kept prisoner on the boat, but they could roam anywhere they wanted to. What are they going to do? Uh, these were, for the most part, very young and very old person uh, captured it. And from the Africa Corps. At that time, Rommel was, was using the bottom of the barrel in order to uh, keep going. And these people, uh, we, we saved their lives by being, uh, by capturing them and, and bringing them home and giving them a square meal and so on. And, and of course, they entertained us at night with beautiful music and uh, songs and so on. So it sounds like there was some camaraderie between the there ship's was. crew and the, and the prisoners. As far as I, I never saw a single act of, of enmity or between any of the German prisoners or so on. We had, we established the regulations with their officer. And we said, Here, here's, here's what goes down. You can go here, but you can't go there. Okay, and uh, uh, and you don't assemble in larger than maybe six or seven people. But uh, other than that, feel free. And if you have any questions, just ask a sailor. Okay. Yeah, and uh, no, there was no purpose in, in guarding them. They, where were they going to go? They were being taken home to work on farms in, in uh, the Middle East and, and, and uh, sleep with... Uh, American women. Yeah. That, uh, where do you suppose all these young blonde kids came from? They're, 
Uh, yeah. A very, a very high rate of German prisoners were uh, absorbed into the American culture. I was not aware of that. Yeah. After you finished tra uh, traversing the Atlantic several times, you then ended up going across the Pacific Ocean, did you not? Yeah. Only went across the Pacific once, and I was the chief mate on the ship that went across. While we were there, uh, when was the armistice? The armistice had been declared about a month before we got there. Now, now the business is to put together a nation that they that they have blown apart, and and there were. There were still, at that time, many small Japanese garrisons in the Pacific Islands who had been overlooked in the, in the main uh, campaign. So my ship was commandeered by a, by a government agency and, and, and converted into, a, uh, into a, a simple transport ship. The Japanese transport ship. They put a, a Japanese crew on it, renamed it, and his job thereafter was to go from island to island and and pick up the uh, uh, people there. Our job, we had an option at that time to transfer to other active uh, U.S. ships in port, or or to return home and to uh, continue a life at home, because the war is over, and we are civilians, and so on. So I chose to come home. <clears throat> and uh, of the probably 35 crew of, the, of our ship going over, about 25 of them elected to return to the States. So I was nominally named the master of that crew. And we were put aboard another U.S. ship and came and were returned to America, and I returned to civilian life. Did you have any problems adjusting back to civilian life after that? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, innumerable problems, yeah. Do you care to elaborate any? No, I don't want to elaborate. It's too complex. Okay. It's, uh, 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 all of my training during the war was to be a ship's officer, and to uh, uh, so uh, well they didn't need ship's officers anymore. All of a sudden, there are a lot of ship's officers, so uh, so I had to find other work that was suitable for me, and I had never uh, had any other kind of training, so it was very difficult for me to. And, and I also was beginning to have a family by then. So I had a very difficult job to uh, uh, acclimate uh, my transfer from from the sea to a, uh, a a land profession, and I just experimented around and so on. And I finally found work that suited me, and the rest is history. So. Okay. What is your attitude toward the uh, the German people today? Do you hold any animosity? I, I am. That, that's uh, it's not a question that that anyone can really answer. So, what do I know about the German people today? It's, it's, I, I'm not qualified to answer that question, so I won't try. Okay. And do you I, I, I guess I think they have a, a terrible job uh, acclimating their immigration problem and their racist problem. They are really being tested right now. And uh, but my attitude toward them is they're doing the best they can. And before we finish, then, um, do you have any any message that you would like? I'm sorry. Do you have any message that you would like to give to current and future generations based on your experience in World yeah. War II? Yeah, under no circumstances fight a war. Okay. No war is appropriate. If you can't sit down and discuss your differences, then then don't. 
do not fight wars, period. I see you have a hat on the table. You belong to an organization called Veterans for I Peace. Devoted my, I devoted my peacetime life to Veterans for Peace. And, uh, you know, this is a national organization. It's an online organization. People should look it up. Then they, they will know more about the Birchia Marine probably than they could elsewhere. But Veterans for Peace uh, works for peace. So, okay. <laughs> Are there any last comments that you would like to make? Any what? Any last minute comments you would like to make? I want to thank you, Dave, for this opportunity to do this. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank you very much. Okay. All right.